So good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar on energy sufficiency, how to shape sustainable behaviors. Uh, the webinar is uh, uh, organized by the Covenant of Mayors Europe office with the support of the Energy and Climate uh, uh, Department of the Paris Region Institute that I thank very much, and in particular, uh, Marilo falk Massé, who is our moderator today. The webinar is meant to introduce you to the topic of energy sufficiency and uh, to showcase how it can be implemented in uh, the several sectors of our societies, from mobility to building to digital infrastructure. Before we start, I invite everyone to switch off the cameras and the microphone. Of course, speakers will do the opposite when the time comes. Um, if you have any questions, please use the, the chat. And I also inform you, as you already saw in the message below, that the webinar will be recorded and the recording will be shared through the Current of Mayors uh, channels. Okay. Sorry. Uh, before getting into energy sufficiency, I want to briefly introduce what the Covenant of Mayors Europe is. So the Covenant is the world leading initiative on climate and energy addressed mainly to local authorities, but also involving uh, ministry, regions, energy agencies, NGOs, and so on. The initiative was launched in 2008. Uh, at first in European Union uh, member states only, and then open to the entire world. Uh, nowadays, we count more than 10,400 municipalities, of which more uh, than 10,200 are from the European Union member states. Um, we have today the city of Antwerp, which is uh, one of our most active uh, municipalities, and uh, we call them signatories because they sign a commitment document. We also have other type of members. In particular, we have more than 200 of what we call coordinators. So ministries, national energy agencies, regions, provinces, and counties that join the initiative to provide technical and financial support to the municipalities, to the signatories. We also have uh, the category of supporters. So again, more than 200 supporters from the European Union. And they are non-profit organizations such as energy agencies, associations of local authorities, NGOs, and so on. And again, we have uh, today one of our best representatives, the Energy Contour CIDOST. Okay, so what are the benefits of being a member of the community? Well, first of all, uh, every member receives endorsement and recognition from the European Commission and uh, large visibilities at European and international level, uh, mainly thanks to the Covenant of Mayors uh, communication channels, promotion of their activities, speaker spots in uh, European international events, and so on. Uh, members can also benefit from networking opportunities and knowledge sharing experience with similar organizations in Europe and in the rest of the world and capacity building opportunities, both between peers and with experts. Uh, they also have the opportunity to promote their good practices and the achievements with the world community and consolidate their territorial developments and strengthen multi-level governance. But one important feature that is offered mainly to coordinators, actually mainly to regions, um, sorry, uh, so one uh, feature that is offered to regions is the possibility to have scientific and technical feedback and recognitions by the European Commission and the Joint Research Center of the European Commissions on uh, uh, tools and methodologies for action plans development and the enjoy of a group analysis for all the action plans developed with these uh, methodologies or tools. Another important feature, perhaps the main one, is uh, our platform called My Covenant. Uh, this is mainly used by municipalities to submit their action plans and report on their progress um, and achievements, but it's also used by all the community to uh, share their good practices, um, connect to each other, uh, follow our e-learning modules, and so on. On the 21st of April of 2021, the Covenant of Mayors Europe started a new path. Uh, and our aim now is to support our community to reach climate neutrality by 2050. 
The municipalities that join now the covenant of mayors or renew their commitments to the initiative uh, pledge to cut their greenhouse gases emissions, to improve their resilience to climate change, to tackle energy poverty, and to ensure a just transition for all the citizens and inhabitants of their territories. Um, for Covenant of Mayors Europe, climate neutrality is defined as a state in which human activities result in no net effect on the climate system. Both the Covenant of Mayors Office and the European Commission are committed to ensure a just transition and fair transition for all the members of the community in all the member states with uh, a core principle of leaving no one behind. Um, this is, means that while the ultimate object for all the members remain the same, which is climate neutrality by 2050, in reality, we have uh, implemented a differentiated approach, meaning that uh, contrary to what happened on the past, when we had uh, one single target equal for all members, now it's up to the members, to the municipalities, to decide what are the steps uh, to reach climate neutrality and so what are their mid-term targets on uh, GHG emissions reduction. The only limit that we impose is that such targets shall be uh, in line with European Union objectives and at least as ambitious as the national targets. We also want to foster the development of local climate packs with citizens and stakeholders, as we believe that these groups shall be included both in the development and in the implementation of action plans if we really want to achieve climate neutrality. Uh, so this is what, uh, this is everything, uh, sorry. This is all for, from my side. Um, for those of you that are not yet member of the community, I invite you to join and you can see on the slide uh, uh, the link to register according to your category. And of course, if you have questions, you can contact the help desk at info.umayors.eu. And now I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Marilo falk -Massé. Marilo is Energy Strategy and European Project Chief Manager at AREC, the Energy and Climate Department of Paris Region Institute. She supports local authorities in their energy and eco ecological transition projects, and she's also associated with European projects of the agency dealing with uh, these issues. She's member of the French Committee of the European Energy Award and member of the Board of Directors of ATE, the French Associations for Energy Management and Environment. And Marilo, the floor is yours. Just mm -hmm. tell me if uh, you want me to share the screen or you want to share yours. Thank you, Marie-Angela, nice to, to be to see you this morning and to, to share uh, ideas uh, on energy sufficiency with, with everybody this morning. Um, so um, maybe I will try to share my screen. Uh, do we have the poll now? I share my screen or we can do you see my screen? Is that okay for you? Yes, yes so you want me to large the poll? Um maybe we can have we can launch the poll before my presentation. So in your opinion, what actions are related to energy sufficiency? So you have a multiple choice. Uh, so um, insulating a building, reducing the size of your fridge, limiting your urban sprawl, sharing your car with your neighbor, installing an efficient boiler. Um, so let's go, you can answer to this poll. And maybe we will have this poll a second time, if possible, after all the presentations. So, so far we have only 33 persons out of 48. So perhaps we can wait uh, one minute more to allow everybody to, to okay. answer.
do I need to stop the, the share of my screen if we want to, to see? No, the... don't worry, because it's in a pop up window. So when I will hand the pool, uh, everybody will see the results. OK, thank you. So do you want me to present my, my presentation or we, uh, we shall we end the, the pool and launch the results? Okay. Launch the results. Okay, now you should see the results on the screen. Okay, this is really interesting because um, um okay. Uh, some of the of the answers are not related to energy sufficiency but to energy efficiency that's what we are going to to see the, this morning um maybe we will uh, comment this after the presentation if, is it possible after the third presentations of course as you please so do i stop sharing the pool so that you can start okay thank you maria angela Okay, and it's possible for me to. I don't know why. No, it's okay. Uh, Marilo, we received a message that uh, the volume is quite low. Can you just raise your voice, please? Raise my voice. Is it better like this? Uh, for me, yes. But, little, uh, a little bit more will be better. Okay. So I think it's my computer. Sorry. It's an old one. So what is energy sufficiency? Uh, energy sufficiency is an approach that aims to, to reduce uh, energy consumption through changes in behavior, lifestyle, and collective organization. Energy sufficiency is the first pillar of the uh, energy uh, transition. Uh, and it's dealing with the prioritization of the needs. The second pillar is the energy efficiency. And energy efficiency uh, is dealing with the technologies, the efficient technologies that reduce consumption at the scale of a given object or, um, or system. And the goal of the sufficiency um, is not the product, but the service. Uh, as an example, we need to communicate. We don't need a smartphone. Uh, we need comfort. We not, not eat the boilers. Uh, we need fresh food, but not uh, refrigerators, for example. So if we compare to the, if we go back to the, to the poll, uh, to, to the poll, uh, the, um, yes, installing an efficient boiler is not energy sufficiency. Insulating a building is not energy efficiency. Both are energy efficiency. But the other one are dealing with energy sufficiency. When, we, when you reduce the size of your fridge um, to adapt to your needs, uh, when you, you are limiting your band sprawl, uh, and also when you share your car with your neighbor. We are going to, to, to see some examples now. <clears throat> problem with my slides. Okay, so what is our, uh, first of all, what is our doing uh, with energy sufficiency? We are in charge of the regional animation to support the regional energy and climate strategy. That is to say, it's more than energy sufficiency, but also energy efficiency, renewable energies, uh, circular economies, and so on. A lot of issues dealing with uh, energy and ecological transition. Um, we are currently organizing a workshop series um, with the, the objective um, and the objective is to imagine together a chosen fair collective and innovation, innovative sufficiency for the regions and uh, to propose recommendations to uh, the local authorities. 
we are launching also an observatory of initiatives dealing with energy sufficiency in the region, but also in France, in Europe, and all over the world in order to, to learn uh, from the others. Uh, in January, we will launch a study on the imaginaries of sufficiency for the region. And we would like also to have an experimentation with local authorities next year um, in uh, the Paris region. Some example of sufficiency. First of all, the structural sufficiency. That is to say, creating in the organization of space or of our activities the conditions for moderation in our consumption. We have some examples um, categorized by objectives. By example, <clears throat> if refreshing the, if the objective is to refresh the city, we have a lot of means. We can use nature based solutions, reflecting materials. Uh, also water management, and this will have some impacts. Um, by example, improve the summer comfort, uh, use uh, less air conditioning, and so on. Um, the city of Paris uh, uses uh, this in its, in its adaptation plan for uh, 2050. Um, you can also come combat the urban sprawl, and this will have in, important impacts in the reducing of distance, uh, the decreasing number of travelers also. Uh, this is the concept of the 15 minutes city, uh, dealing with urban proximity. And uh, another example um, is to ensure equitable access to public space developing pedestrian zones, bicycle paths, and also public transport. Uh, this will have a positive impact uh, on active mobility and also on health. Um, in Ile-de-France, by example, uh, the region is developing a, reg a regional bicycle path network um, uh, just parallel to the, to the public transport uh, network. We can talk also about collaborative sufficiency, that is to say the mutualization of equipments and of their use. Uh, by example, the car sharing formulas or also the co-working premise. So you can adapt this uh, to, um, to, the, to the housing, to the travel, or also to, to work uh, by developing, by example, collective laundries. We know that uh, a lot of countries um, in Europe they are developing co collective co laundries like in uh, Germany, Belgium, and so on. It's not the case in France, but uh, some uh, experimentation uh, are launching uh, uh, in collective laundries. Uh, this is also related to uh, do-it-yourself store, repair cafe, and so on. And in matter of travel, uh, it's dealing with car sharing, car pooling, public transport, but also uh, the solidarity, uh, the garage and uh, bikes uh, dealing with solidarity economy. And in matter of works, uh, you have uh, the third place, uh, the co-working premise, and uh, some uh, example of scalable architecture that is to say, uh, buildings uh, that are shared uh, maybe between uh, during, the, during the day uh, with the administrative, uh, um, as, a, as, as administrative pre premises. And uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, premise can be uh, occupied in the night uh, by associations uh, or also. Um, another example of sufficiency is a sufficiency dealing with uses. Is a, that is to say the proper use of equipment with a view to reducing consumption. Um, an example is the speed limit on the road. Uh, there, are, there was an important uh, European project uh, on this. The name was Energy Neighborhood. 
um, with uh, Nerjini Borod uh, was uh, launched by Germany and um, some French, uh, uh, there were also some French partners in, uh, in, this, um, in this European project. Uh, and uh, it's uh, the challenges between family in order to uh, save energy, save water, and so on. Um, you have also the educational apartments. Uh, we have in Western Paris a traveling educational apartment. This is really interesting to show to people how to control the consumption of heating, electricity, and water. Uh, the standby power of electrical appliance. Um, another interesting example is the public um, lighting um, with the starred towns and villages. Uh, we have 22 local authorities uh, awarded uh, in the Paris region uh, by a national association dealing with uh, in, uh, light pollution. Um, and uh, uh, by example, it's to, to cut uh, the, the, the light during the night or to limit the number of, uh, of lighting points. Um, you can also have example uh, dealing with eco-driving uh, training uh, with the, the group La Poste in France is dealing with this. And the last one is the dimensional sufficiency uh, uh, which is the correct dimensioning of facilities in relation to their condition of use. Um, example, uh, choose equipment adapted to the use. Uh, so you choose a vehicle, uh, the size and the power of your vehicle, vehicle uh, adapted to your use, to the number of, of travelers and so on. And it can also be uh, applied to the size of the housing. Uh, with the development of the tiny house. Um, okay, uh, you can find more information on uh, federm.org about energy sufficiency. Uh, there is a working group uh, dealing with this and also a workshop series organized last year. I thank you for your attention and we will find more information um, on our website and also on the website of the NF network and the ECCEE -E -E <laughs> uh, website. Thank you for your attention. And I will stop to share my screen. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there is uh, some question now or not. Uh, for the time being, no, nothing no. on the chat. Okay, so I'm going to introduce the next speaker, Joanna. So Joanna Wallin is our next speaker. Uh, Joanna is a project manager and communications officer at uh, Energy Agency uh, of South East Sweden, uh, Energy Contor Sidost. And um, she has worked with a number of cargo bike projects for the five last year, and she's going to talk about how the public sector can work towards an energy sufficiency transport system by promoting cargo bikes as one of the solutions. The floor is yours, Joanna. Thank you, Marie-Laure. Uh, I'm going to share my screen first. Uh, so we have that started. So. And yes, I'm going to talk about cargo bikes as an energy sufficient solution to urban transport needs. And um, in urban communities, around 80% of the car trips are shorter than three to four kilometers. And where a normal bike or a bus might not be a convenient alternative, an electric, uh, electrically powered cargo bike can very well do the job. And in larger cities, cargo bikes has become an ordinary sight, but we've shown that even in uh, small and medium sized cities, cargo bikes can be a successful alternative. Um, <clears throat> but when we're talking about a sustainable transport system, you have to bear in mind that there is not just one solution for us to achieve a sustainable transport uh, system. 
And it's not only about choosing the right type of vehicle or the type of fuel, it's also about making other choices. And to do that, the first thing is to be to ask yourself, is this trip even necessary? And if it is, what are your choices? Having an energy sufficient approach to travel can mean that you choose to use a cargo bike instead of using a car or a lorry or something like that. Um, by even partially replacing travel by car or local cargo distribution by lorries, it's possible to achieve both reduce climate impact and obtain health, ben health benefits. And cargo bikes are on the rise as a part of a solution to tackling those short distances and last mile solutions. So cargo bikes are becoming an important component in the solution for future logistics and transports in our cities. And using cargo bikes has a number of benefits uh, that support different goals a, a public actor might have. It's the strategic perspective that makes cargo bikes not a choice for, for your own transport, but it's also a choice of something uh, bigger, like reduced CO2 emissions, health improvements, better air qualities, reduced traffic jams, and so on. And it's also cost saving. A cargo bike is much cheaper than a car or a lorry. <clears throat> So how could a city then lead the transition? Municipalities are key actors in the transition uh, towards a sustainable transport system, both within their own organizations and as a driving force for residents and businesses. Like within the municipality, cargo bikes can be used at schools, by street cleaners, for document transportations and so on. And letting residents try cargo bikes as part of their daily routine, grocery shopping, taking the kids to school, commute to work, or travel to places in their leisure time uh, is a way for them to try to see the possibilities. And the same with businesses and organizations. A municipality can offer cargo bike trials for companies that deliver food or material, transport small, small cargo at short distances. And in that way, either leading by example or helping other actors to try uh, the cargo bike um, for their needs. Uh, I've been working with a number of cargo bike projects in the last five, six years. And in the last one here, which, which was called Cobium, we had some uh, special findings. The project was about having lending schemes or cargo bike pools set up to, to let residents and um, uh, businesses and municipalities try a cargo bike. <clears throat> and uh, a large part of that was cargo bike libraries. And we found that they, were, they are an effective way of promoting cargo by setting up a lending system for, for actors to choose. And it shows that between, uh, on, the, on the evaluations we've done shows that between 20 to 40% of the participants have been borrowing bikes from the bike libraries, considering purchase, purchasing uh, the same or a different model of uh, cargo bike after they try it, period. And we uh, had GPS trackers on our uh, uh, cargo bike in the project. And it, the data shows that 65% of all the trips were shorter than two kilometers. And this confers the assumption that uh, cargo bikes are best suited for, for city driving. And by an estimation made by some Swedish traffic researchers, it shows that a cargo bike uh, saves about five tons of CO2 uh, to a year compared to a small truck. So it's actually measurable change or lower of, 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 of um, emissions. Our evaluation also showed that municipalities that offer uh, good opportunities for landing uh, cargo bikes is a good way of you know, supporting the modal shift to cargo bikes. And as a leading by example, there are like two main, main applications for internal use. Either you buy a cargo bike and place it directly at a, a specific department, or you set up a sort of cargo bike pool within the organization where employees can borrow bike when they need it. 
<clears throat> Another thing to, to bear in mind when it comes to cargo bikes, that they differ from like a regular bike because they can be two or three or four wheels. They can have cargo in the front or in the back. They can be designed to carry people, cargo, or provide services like a coffee shop or a tool or repair shop or something like that. So the type you want depends on your needs. So it's really important that you do some sort of a needs analysis before you go and buy a cargo bike if you want it to work, uh, work good in your organization. And another thing that is important when it comes to cargo bikes that differ from, from regular bikes is the size of it, especially when it comes to bike lanes and parking and such. But even if a cargo bike is larger than a, a, <clears throat> an ordinary uh, bike, they're much, much smaller than a car or a truck. So it's still very uh, efficient. So I mentioned this project uh, that we've had, Cobium. We were, uh, it was a South Baltic, Baltic program funded project uh, and it ended in October this year. And we were eight partners working together to test these different strategies, pilots for supporting the modal shifts to cargo bikes. So uh, at the cobion.eu website, you'll find a, a guideline, which um, uh, is a support for cities that want to explore the possibilities of promoting cargo bikes within their own organization or out to citizens or businesses and organizations. You can also find more details and stories about the pilots on the web page. And I'll put uh, in the chat, I'll put some links to the films that we made. We made a films where we have interviewed and followed people that borrowed bikes and municipalities that done that and their experiences of this. And so I really um, I think you should look at that when you have a time later on. And um, that's actually what I had to say, uh, are there any, any questions so far? Uh, Joanna, you sent me a pool. Do you want me to launch it? Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, sure. You do that. I'll stop sharing or do you? You can keep sharing, it's not a problem. The pool will be in a pop-up window. All right, okay. So I was a bit curious about you. <clears throat> if you don't have any questions for you, I have for you, for, uh, for you. so please. Uh, uh, read through the pop-out uh, question, the poll, and uh, I'm very interested in, to see uh, your answers. Can you all see it? Yes, yes. And do we have any, any answers? I guess we will come back to that, or are you planning to show um, the results immediately? We can, uh, we can wait one minute so that everybody has the time to answer to the poll, and then, uh, yes, we can close it and share the results. Mm -hmm. So far, uh, only eight, 20 participants over 49 answered. So yeah, we can wait uh, one more minute. Great. <clears throat> And uh, as I said, I'll, I'll put some, some links in the chat for you. And are you, uh, if there are any questions, I can't see any questions in the chat or do you have questions uh, also if somebody just raises their hand? Joanna, Dominique speaking, I cannot see you, the link you share. Okay, they're coming right now. Okay, yeah, now yes. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try to talk and copy and okay. <laughs> edit at the same time. <laughs> right. Thank you. So I'll stop my sharing now. And um, and if you think of any questions, you put just put them in the chat and I'll ask them, answer them uh, during. Otherwise, I think I'm done for now. And I'll be, uh, oh yeah, that's a question. Oh, it's really hard to say how many countries in the world or in Europe that works with cargo bikes, but I know there are projects going on at many different pre uh, countries uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, right now, but I don't have a compilation of what's going on right now, but um, yeah. Uh, Joanna, and while we wait mm -hmm. for the pool, there is also another uh, question. Mm -hmm, yes. that, can you mm -hmm. mention something on how to arrange the charging of electric cargo bikes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, 
uh, whether you have a sort of cargo bike pool within your municipality or if you have le like a lending scheme, it's important to 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 um, share the instructions on how and when to to charge the cargo bike. And that's the thing in the guidelines that we discuss a lot, uh, the the organization around the, the the cargo bike library so that everybody knows uh, how how to drive a cargo bike, but that because that could be a bit different than driving in a regular bike, and it's also the routines for charging. If you have like a cargo bike pool, you should have rules like you have for a carpool: leave your vehicle clean and charge or filled up with uh, whatever fuel it is. It's the same thing. You have to think of the same kind of things uh, to have the routines on how to do it and instruct the users how to do it. But otherwise, you know, charging an uh, electric bike is, is just plugging in an ordinary uh, electrical, um, um, you know, plugging in, in, in the wall. It's no special charging like for, for electrical cars, for example. Thank you. So if you agree, I would uh, stop the poll and share the results so that you can comment on them. Mm -hmm. And you can see again the results on the popping up window. Great. So transport is not uh, an issue for most of you, but maybe you could sort of, you have colleagues or anything, you can uh, give them a tip or, or send them the information for on, on the website and say, because I think we have some really nice, interesting results there. And, uh, and as for you that you might know, uh, but no, don't know where to start, I'll just uh, direct you to that guidelines because it's a sort of a, um, uh, uh, a guideline how to start, what to think about, how to put it into your strategic perspectives and how these actions can help you reach your, your climate and energy targets within your organization. And it's also very practical what to think about, as I said, with the charging and the routines for this and the needs analysis, everything is there. So, and, uh, and you that are all already, you know, working with cargo bikes and promotion. Yay, cargo bikes are nice, <laughs> right? So, see, it's not working. Uh, let's try again. Yeah, somebody I put up the address. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Right, and if you have any more questions, put them in the chat or save them to last in the program, pro program for today. I'm gonna to be in the general question and answer. Um, uh, part of the project uh, or, or the program. Thank you. Thank you, Luna. Um, you, you, you are an, an inspiration, your projects are an inspiration for the Paris uh, region. Um, now the regional council um, is given subsidies to municipalities um, that put in place cargo bikes for deliveries. So thank you. <laughs> Great, interesting. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, we are now uh, going to give the floor to Jan Mulleman. So Jan Mulleman is the coordinator of the Eco House, uh, which is the demonstration and advice center for the city of Antwerpen in Belgium, Antwerp. Um, where citizens can get inspiration, advice, support for energy savings and energy renovations, and also renewable energies. Uh, and Jan is also uh, the coordinator of the Energy Saving Fund, where citizens can get financing for energy renovations and renewable energy. Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Marilor. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Yes, this should perfect. be visible. Yes, perfect. Okay. Well, thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar and, um, and giving me the opportunity to present some of our uh, experiences on, on, on um, energy sufficiency and, and most specifically the, the social um, innovation in energy transition project that we have here in uh, the city of Antwerp. Um, first, a little bit about the city of Antwerp and why we um, put so much focus on um, social innovation in uh, energy transition. 
Well, as, as any large city, we have um, uh, ambitious climate goals. Uh, we uh, are a signatory of the uh, Covenant of Mayors. Um, but we notice, just as any large city would, uh, would notice, I guess, um, that not everyone can, not all the, the citizens, um, have the same means uh, to um, take part in this uh, energy transition. Um, we notice that we have large um, uh, step to make uh, with regard to energy retrofitting of, of, the, uh, of the housing uh, stock, um, but there are large obstacles there. Um, about half of our population lives in um, um, housing that they rent, uh, private rent. Um, and we also have about three thirds of the uh, housings that are uh, apartment buildings where a majority of votes is needed. Um, uh, but most specifically, um, we have in Antwerp very high uh, energy poverty, um, which makes that um, the, we have to make sure that these climate ambitions, uh, these climate goals, um, that we have to make a just transition there and that uh, everyone can take part in this um, energy transition. We do have a set of instruments already in place for a number of years uh, that specifically focus, um, let's say, social target groups um, to help them with their um, energy savings, energy renovation, renewable energy. Um, but still we see, uh, we feel the need for social innovation and um, specifically to work together with uh, external stakeholders that uh, bring a lot of insights uh, and, and new ideas too. Um, so we joined the summit project um, where the central question was how and to what extent can social innovation contribute to the transition towards sustainable and affordable energy um, for all? Um, so it's a living labs approach um, where we experiment and learn and try to integrate that in, into our um, way of thinking and, and setting up new projects. Uh, it's a project with uh, five cities, um, each doing, each of them doing um, projects based on their current situation and, and ideas. Uh, it's a Horizon 2020 project. Um, and I would like to highlight um, what we have done in this uh, project um, and what we learned from it. Um, the first step was that we wanted to sit together with a large number of stakeholders um, to ask them how should we as a city um, tackle this problem and, and go for social innovation uh, in energy transition. Uh, a long list of, uh, of uh, uh, ideas came out of that. So we had to uh, do a, a number of uh, iterations and rounds to, to select uh, four projects um, that I will um, explain you about uh, in the next slides. Uh, the first one was to set up an, an energy community at the level of a street, uh, a street specifically a street where um, the, the um, people who live there um, have, uh, are, are, it, it's a social um, target group, let's say, uh, these people don't always have the means to um, invest in renewable energy. Um, so we wanted to see, is it possible to create an energy community um, and to share renewable energy um, and to share experiences? Um, so we wanted to make sure that everyone would have access to renewable energy. And it's a collaboration with an energy cooperative here in Antwerp um, and a number of other uh, external partners and of course the city of Antwerp. Um, I'll come to the results of these projects later. Uh, first, say something about the second project in, in this, uh, uh, the second objective. Um, to design a rental system for energy efficient household appliances. We see a lot of um, citizens having problems with their energy bills um, where 
household appliances uh, that consume a lot, uh, old household appliances, fridges, freezers, uh, laundry machines, um, cause a part of this uh, high energy consumption. Um, so we wanted to see if it is possible uh, to create a rental system. It's in fact an existing project in the Western part of Flanders um, that we wanted to see if we can implement this in, in Antwerp. Um, an all-inclusive uh, service uh, for uh, um, these people, uh, where it is uh, the most efficient um, household appliance and um, and a quality uh, control. Uh, if if the if the household appliance is uh, is damaged or broken, it will be replaced and so on. And also there, it is a, a collaboration between. Uh, social services in Antwerp, um, environment department in Antwerp, and uh, and um, a business uh, um, as well. Uh, third part is um, something that I cannot translate. I, I tried very hard to, to find an English word for it. A Notecoop funds, it's a fund, it's a rolling fund to um, um, help invest in um, uh, energy renovation and also the improvement of um, insufficient quality in, um, in houses for a specific group of people, people who got stuck in a house that they bought with all their means uh, because they, they um, can't find a rental place. They're kind of forced to buy a house with the maximum of their means and they buy something that is of course of low quality and then get stuck in, uh, in, in this situation because all the all the means they have um, go to the energy consumption of this house, and they don't have the financial means anymore to um, to make the necessary investments, uh, so that this uh, this energy bill would go down. Um, and it's a it's a fund, in, it's a loan that they uh, uh, it's a bullet uh, loan, so they pay it back all in the end uh, and not on a monthly basis. Um, also here, it's a collaboration between social social services in, in of the city of Antwerp, the environment department uh, of the city of Antwerp, but also the Flemish government and the um, electric uh, electric grid uh, operator. Um, and then a, a fourth one, which I will not go into detail uh, too much because due to a change of uh, um, uh, legal uh, aspects. Um, the business model for this uh, project uh, was altered uh, right at the uh, right when it started, and uh, so it, it got stuck uh, somewhere there. Um, some results: um, the first project, the energy community project, um, got a lot of attention in this street and uh, a good response. Um, the most important part there is that there was uh, someone in this street that wanted to um, collaborate intensively. So one of the key successes there is to have one citizen uh, that uh, one or several citizens that want to um, go ahead with this project and, and, and talk to neighbors. And uh, uh, from there, it went very well. We have a number of uh, energy monitors that are installed. PV panels are, are installed uh, on one house and one school. Uh, three batteries installed, and they plan an electric car, uh, a shared electric car um, next year. Um, and the project is also continued in, uh, in a climate fund uh, from uh, Antwerp um, to uh, upscale it. The rental system for um, energy efficient households uh, household appliances um, got tendered, uh, the, the agreements are being finalized and the rental um, will start uh, at the beginning of next year. Uh, and also the supplier is, is, uh, is contracted. So uh, um, we're looking forward to those results um, over the next years. Um, as said, the, 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 the third one, uh, Collective Hood, is, is on PV uh, solar panels on, on, on rental houses, but due to uh, uh, legal changes, uh, this uh, project is, is currently on hold. And the last one 
is has been a long and difficult process to uh, to make sure that all the city departments uh, involved um, are um, in agreement and and know how to deal with this uh, these specific loans. But the first two contracts have been approved last week, last Friday, and um, and meanwhile uh, the Flemish government has has opened a, a second call, um, and Antwerp has uh, decided. Uh, uh, we were very happy to see that Antwerp has decided to sign in on the second uh, call as well. Um, but maybe more importantly for you all is is to see that what we learned from this all is that. Um, um, a fair energy transition is uh, something that um, uh, needs a lot of collaboration and and needs funding. Um, so what we did is is afterwards uh, um, we have a, a small budget uh, in the city of Antwerp, um, which we call us uh, the Antwerp Climate Fund. Um, and from the results of the of the Sonnet project, we decided to open a call for a project specifically on fair and just uh, energy transition. And the uh, there were four projects uh, submitted, and three of them have been approved. Um, one of which is, as I said, the uh, uh, an extension on the um, uh, energy community. Uh, Stalinstraat energy community uh, uh, project from the uh, Sonnet. And another one is uh, uh, solar car cargo hub. So I was very interested to hear on the uh, uh, the previous uh, speaker, Johanna, um, with their uh, experiences. So uh, looking forward to see those results as well. But I think my main uh, take home message here is that, that uh, social equality in, in energy sufficiency and energy transition is a verb. Is, is something that will not happen all by itself. It needs a lot of collaboration between different stakeholders uh, within your city and, and within um, uh, stakeholders outside of your city administrations, and um, as well as uh, the citizens themselves um, who are more than willing to, um, to step up and, and take part in these um, projects. But it will all, always be case by case and a challenge by challenge because every single challenge will require different stakeholders to take part, uh, a different approach maybe, um, but a good collaborative action. Um, and it will need financing. In my view, I put a question mark there. If uh, anyone disagrees, uh, I'm more than happy to uh, learn. Um, but it will need financing because they will not happen all by themselves. And those were my take home messages and I'm happy to take any questions uh, as you like. Thank you, Jan. This is very inspiring also. Uh, and uh, I, I like the social equality. Social equality has a very important goal of the energy transition. Um, uh, I, I, have, I don't know if there are questions now, but I have one um, about uh, your, your um, community at the level of the street. Um, how did you convince people to participate? How did you choose this specific street? Um, well, we, um, we communicated uh, that we were looking for a street to... Uh, to um, um, to take part in this experiment. And, and as I mentioned, we had one very uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, citizen that said, uh, I believe in this kind of approach. Um, I believe this is necessary. And um, I see this as a way to, um, uh, to, uh, to communicate with my uh, fellow uh, citizens in, in my street to get to know them even. Eh? Some, some, you know some of them, you know that maybe you will be able to convince some of them. Uh, other people in your street, you don't know them, you know their faces, but you don't, you have never discussed anything about energy transition or whatever. Uh, so one citizen who was very uh, enthusiastic and uh, um, um, collaborated on this. Um, so that, that will be a challenge if you want to expand this, uh, but um, um, 
there are also streets that have um, a similar uh, uh, projects uh, uh, doing things together with people in their street on completely different uh, topics or subjects. Um, and those are already have a group. So if they are convinced about renewable energy, they might be able to, uh, to replicate this project in, in their street. Okay. So thank you very much, Jan. Um, now um, we, we are, there is another um, question in the chat, but now uh, I, I propose that we go to, to the presentation of Bella and afterwards uh, we will uh, answer to, to, the, to the question. Perfect. Um, I can try to answer a little bit in the chat already. And uh, meanwhile, we'll listen to the next speaker. Thank okay. you. Uh, good. Thank you very much, Jan. We are going now to give the floor to Bella Lotto. So Bella is the founder of Point de Mire. So Point de Mire is the house of sustainable computer science, information and computer science. And uh, she is also the co-founder of Mir Advice and Training, Mir Conseil et Formation. Uh, and she's the author of several publications such as the handbook of a more responsible digital life. And I think it's available in English, um, in French, both in French and in English, huh, Bella. So yeah. the, the, the floor is yours now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for this invitation. Uh, I had uh, some issues with my camera when I wanted to share my screen. So maybe- Do you want me to share? Your presentation? Uh, no, because it would be uh, more easy for me to 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 have the now. But I maybe I won't be there with the the picture. But maybe but with my voice and no problem. So uh, if you want, I can try to share the screen and give you control of my uh, computer. Uh, sorry, just uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Can you put full screen? Yeah, I am trying. I'm trying and trying and trying. <laughs> Just maybe some delay. Yeah. Do you have it? Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very much for this invitation. And um, my subject is to um, I'm I'm going to try to to answer the the question. What could be e sobriety? I just wanted to to say just be, uh, just before that Point de Mire is a house of sustainable IT and not scientific something, but no problem. It's uh, it's uh, it's an activity uh, that I have for several years now, ten years. Okay, so what could be uh, is sobriety? Uh, that would be my my question, and. Um, and then I will I will like to start with uh, several uh, key figures. Uh, uh, for example, the the digital world is um, now made up uh, of uh, 34 billion equipment uh, equipments with around 4 billion users. And today we have, uh, for example, 50 percent of the worldwide population connected to the internet uh, through uh, several devices, as you know. Uh, digital devices. The size of the digital uh, universe could be could have been multiplied by three to five between um, 2010 to 2025. Uh, indeed, according to a recent study, the number of devices will rise drastically because of connected devices, because of the 5G, you know, and the doubling of the average screen size, including television sets for example, and the electricity production of emerging uh, countries. Um, also, the data will, me, will be uh, multiplied by uh, five from uh, 2018 to 2025. Um, you can see some other key figures from example for uh, primary energy consumption from the digital universe. Electricity consumption and greenhouse gas emission, of course, uh, around 4%. And also two other indicators, water consumption and, uh, and uh, the um, abiotic uh, resources I will talk about later. So if we can, we can see that uh, the, the emission, the greenhouse gas emission are growing like 6 to 8% 
each years, which is very, very fast, too fast, and the, the, the faster sector, uh, which is growing so fast. So uh, if, we can, if we have a look at a simplified life cycle, we have a lot of things to do because most of the users think that IT and internet are um, something like magical. And we all know that here that our digital world is not immaterial. Uh, the problem is that what's going on behind uh, our screen, our computers, our smartphones don't smell anything. They don't spit any black smoke and uh, they seem to be very, very clean, uh, but they are not at all. So as you can see, a product or a service go through several phases, uh, extracting manufacturing, uh, distribution usage and, and of life. And it's very important to visualize uh, the whole picture to have a systemic uh, view. To in understand the sustainability of computers and information appliances, we must look at the life cycle of the devices themselves from the source of the raw materials that are made out of and through the production process they are used by the consumer, us, and finally the disposal. Um, you have to, it's very important to remember that that two third or to two uh, to three quarters, sorry, two third to three quarters of the environmental footprint is happening during the first stage. What this is why I, I put it in red. So about extraction, for example, the digital electronic devices require some of the rarest metal on Earth. And uh, this is, has increased uh, the, the energy demand required to produce the devices. That's partly due to the energy invested in produces uh, these rare resources, but also because of the high purity uh, demanded by the semiconductor industry. The laws of physics requires, require that to make something pure through refining, you have to use more and more energy to remove progr progressively more of the unwanted impurities. And the metal used by the, to make microchips, for example, must be extremely pure. And uh, as uh, any impurities affect the conductive quality and speed to the um, speed of the chip. So to obtain metals we need in a digital uh, industry, we need to extract minerals through mining. Of course, so this industry is an incredibly uh, dirty industry. A huge quantity of rocks have to be destroyed. Water and solvents have to be used only to get a tiny quantity of metal. Uh, pollutions, child exploitation, violation of labor law, uh, population displacement, etc. Uh, working conditions in electronic manufacturing are also catastrophic and we can even talk and I'm not afraid to talk about that because we can talk about e-slavery. Uh, during the usage phase, usage step, this um, it's mostly about consumption, electricity of terminal networks and water for cooling, for instance, data centers. And for the end of life stage, uh, measure, measuring is uh, difficult in uh, at this stage, but several points um, of like uh, pollution of water, of air, of soil, water tables, for instance, and health and human impacts. So uh, this is not very, very, very beautiful, but this is the reality. Uh, how about Europe? According to a new um, study prepared for the parliamentary group of the Greens EFA in the European Parliament, uh, very, very recent because it was last week, <laughs> we can have a key and up-to-date data of the real environment impacts of digital technology in Europe, as well as policy recommendations. As you can see, just very simply, as you can see that um, the majority of the impacts occur during the manufacturing phase of 54% before the equipment is used and 71% and of the environmental impacts come from end user devices. So um, terminals are the very, very big question. Um, you can see also about uh, climate change, resources, waste production and electric consumption. Uh, what, is, uh, what, what are the impacts? always in Europe, 
uh, for one European, this is the equivalent of, to one year of the following. You can, you could, uh, you will be able to read it uh, later if you want. Um, I just wanted to to say uh, also that we we can see here four uh, fundamental environmental uh, indicators, which uh, partially reflect the environmental footprint of the digital world. And my point here is that is to say that digital a footprint is not only a question of energy consumption, not only a question of greenhouse gas emission, but also, and this is very important to, to understand that, is also about abiotic resource depletion and, of course, a tension of fresh air, for example. So it's very important to have this kind of indicator in, in mind. Uh, many other impacts, if you want, if we have the bigger, a bigger picture, like air pollution, soil pollution, loss of biodiversity, and there are also uh, other big social and very, very huge human issues like indecent salaries, labor abuses, conflicts, like in Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo. And uh, we are talking here about conflict murals, as you know, probably, e-waste and illegal export despite the Basel Convention, which controls cross-border, which try to control uh, cross-border movements. So here we have uh, the um, what uh, the Commission, the European Commission uh, review in a list of critical raw materials for the European Union every three years, uh, screening 83 uh, materials and um, we can say that uh, economic importance and supply risk are the two main parameters used to define uh, what we call a criti criticality. Uh, so it's not all, just on, only, it's not only about uh, scarcity, but very, very uh, uh, big problem about economic and supply risk. So uh, what we could say just um, on this um, on this slide is to just to show you that recycling in uh, digital technology is a real problem, a very big problem because you can see a, here a generic smartphone, for example, and the circles indicate blue and, and black indicate metal with uh, metals with uh, recycling rates less than 1%. So you have the majority or the half, half of the minerals which are um, recycling less than recycled, sorry, less than 1%. So the emergency is to think redeployment to give a second life for each equipment. So my conclusion, uh, my last idea, my last uh, thought would be that uh, if we had just one thing to remember would be it would be uh, extending the lifespan of uh, equipment and uh, digital technology is, uh, has to be considered as a non-renewable uh, critical resource um, in less than one and two generation. So e-sobriety uh, is not only about energy in, uh, in our field, it's not about only energy, it's about um, a lot of indicators and, as I said, uh, abiotic uh, resources, for example. So that was just my my uh, I was what I wanted to 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 say and to to tell you, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bella. Uh, well, we learn a lot about digital uh, sufficiency today. Um, before the Q&A session, I would like to, to say that, unfortunately, Mr. Cuff had last minute obligation uh, in the European Parliament, so uh, he couldn't participate uh, this morning. Um, I would like to go back to a um, question in the chat. And uh, Jan, we, we had a question about your partnership with Bosch. Was it hard to get them on board? And how does the project work practically for them? Yes, um, maybe I can say a few words about this. Um, in my view, it was not at all hard for for us to bring them on board. But as I said, it, it was uh, we were replicating a, 
uh, a, a project that uh, ran already in the western part of Flanders. Um, and they had a partnership uh, with Bosch already. Uh, nevertheless, uh, for, for legal reasons, um, we um, this was again tendered and um, um, Bosch uh, reapplied to this. Uh, so it, it does mean that they do see uh, um, a market for them there in, in this um, uh, renting of uh, um, uh, energy efficient household appliances. Um, they are, they meanwhile, they even uh, came with uh, uh, their, uh, a project of their own uh, to try small scale at this moment to try and, and um, have a social employment uh, project um, that, that they have already, a social employment project where they <clears throat> get um, older, um, where they refurbish um, household appliances um, from, from their brand and to bring them back into, in, into circulation, um, which with the last speaker in mind, uh, a longer life for, for each, uh, um, not only for E uh, appliances, but also general household appliances um, is uh, something we all should uh, uh, cheer for. Um, so in, in my view, it was not hard to, to bring Bosch uh, on board, uh, but I, I think uh, the whole thing starts with communicating very well why you want to uh, do this and, um, and giving them flexibility on how to do this. Um, and that's something that works for them. Um, renting these, uh, uh, giving these uh, household appliances for rent and, and um, assuring um, some co business continuation and, and quality assurance of these uh, appliances. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, I think there is now um, a question for Bella, a question from Joanna. Um, Joanna, we saw you raise the hand. Do you want to ask a question or? No, no, no. I was just applauding. Okay, great. Uh, yes, then we have a, a question from Bella in the chat. It's about Bitcoins. And uh, it is known that Bitcoins use more electricity than other devices. And uh, what's Bella's opinion about these issues? Yeah, and that's very a very interesting question. Um, I won't be very very long for this, but because it's a uh, yeah, it's um, it's an issue, of course. Um, it's something like uh, other uh, usage because I didn't I didn't um, um, I didn't talk about uh, a lot of usage usage because uh, the very important is the 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 the, uh, the terminal as I. I I hope you understood that. But um, uh, crypto money, for example, is of course uh, something like which can be compared with a uh, with uh, some country like Switzerland or Ireland uh, in the uh, electricity consumption. So it's uh, it's huge. It's a very very uh, big question, and it's uh, it's an issue. Yeah, but um, don't forget that the the main impact are else <laughs> because uh, they are they are one usage and one usage for example for usage about usage there is uh, the streaming which is a big a big issue as well but it's not so big that uh, then the uh, terminal uh, um, uh, assembling for example or manufacturing so but it's it's a real a new issue crypto money yeah okay thank you Bella. Uh, there is another question. What happened with the green digital chapter? Well, this EU, EU, EU project ended up. Um, uh, you mean the green, green deal, uh, something with the digital chapter? Yeah, they are, the uh, Europe is, uh, is working on it. And um, uh, last week, there was a very, very, uh, as I said, there was a very interesting um, report for, uh, for Europe. And uh, I, maybe I can I can give the give you the link of this this study in the chat later. And uh, they are working on it, but uh, I think it's uh, there is uh, an opposition between what they want would like to do and what are they um, doing in in the facts. 
uh, uh, I can explain myself. There's an opposition. Um, if if we want ease sobriety, we have to sell and to buy less, and this is not the um, our system, uh, um, capitalistic system. So uh, if we understand that uh, ease sobriety is less, um, I I I'm buying less and or I'm selling less. It would be okay, but I think there is uh, an opposition and a contradiction between what we want to do and when when we are calling it sub, when we are dealing about about sobriety, it's understanding that we should change something in the the economic system. That's my opinion. So I don't know, but I think it's a. Uh, um, for example, we we shouldn't say green digital, for example, or green deal. I think the the green digital chapter is something like um, um, I don't want to say greenwashing, but it's something like that because a digital cannot ever be be green because it's always very impactful. So we can do better, but we cannot be green. So I think we should be careful with the with the words. And um, yeah, they're trying to 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 have best practices, and organizations are doing their best, maybe, but uh, we are not uh, at the end of the tunnel. So I don't know if uh, if I answered the question. Mm -hmm. It was rather than an uh, it was rather an opinion. So. Uh, so there is some <clears throat> links in the chat. I don't know if. Well, the question was yeah. not answered. <laughs> yeah, what I said, I, I can say just one more one more word that I know that, uh, for instance, uh, Europe are trying to to defend some uh, repairability uh, index like in France. So uh, I, I, I know that they had to to discuss about this this really question this real question now yeah that was in november so i don't know uh, i don't know anything else about that but i know that it was a question of repairability some something like that yeah okay thank you hmm. by the way Bella, do you think do you have some tips for our digital departments <laughs> in uh, uh, by example in my business or in municipality uh, the, the the principle the 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 main uh, the the first uh, tip will be uh, would be to um, to um, to uh, to be careful with your uh, with your terminal and with your machines because uh, this is the very very uh, first step to um, to have a lifespan very uh, longer and as I said yes uh, just before it's an it's um, usually disappointed to say that because it's very difficult to do that but it's the only one one way to 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 manage and to do some progress in this area you can also be careful with your power management so it would be perfect to um, switch off all the terminals and old machines every day and uh, every night and every weekend, which is not done uh, uh, usually. So uh, power management is something very, very important also. And uh, you can also be uh, careful and uh, do uh, your best with uh, some other, other usage like streaming, like uh, there's a lot of tips with uh, this kind of things. And uh, I can have five minutes to say that because there are a lot of things. And that's why I, I wrote, um, a book about that because to have um, a holistic view and to to give some uh, I think there is uh, maybe 150 tips about this um, like that to do best but uh, um, extending the lifespan of the terminals is the more most important and power management yeah I would say that for the beginning oh, thank you uh, there is another question for Ian there is an increasing interest from EU and region and energy communities who spoke about race and experience sharing. Was it among citizens only? At what scale? How did you manage to involve citizens in taking part in the project? Yes, a very good question. Um, in fact, the um, 
the energy community uh, project that we had in this uh, one street um, uh, predated the the um, uh, the transposition of, of the uh, um, energy communities uh, uh, laws in, in into Belgian uh, uh, legal context. Uh, so we didn't have a, a frame for that. That's why it was done with uh, with an energy com uh, with an energy cooperative, so that everyone who participates uh, at, at least has uh, has this share in in uh, in the energy uh, uh, cooperative. Um, and the um, it is only from the let's see, is it uh, from the start of January uh, next year that the um, um, energy communities law is is effective in in uh, Flanders in Belgium um, and then even then only with a lot of restrictions uh, it will only be uh, half of next year or by the end of next year that it will be uh, um, that some of those restrictions uh, for the startup phase um, will be taken away so at this moment, it is only a very, um, uh, it is not a true energy community. It is rather um, making sure that the whole, that everyone who wants to participate in the street can can share through uh, an, an, an energy cooperation, um, a cooperative, I mean, and, um, and uh, but with a view to expand to a, a true energy community um, as soon as the the legal context uh, allows it. Um, but the experience to have uh, different citizens uh, within the same street uh, discuss about um, participating in uh, solar panels on their roof, uh, solar pan panels on the school. Can we take energy from the school when when they are? Uh, producing energy and not consuming it. How should we do this? This is through local and, and green energy. Um, that in itself brings a um, uh, shifts the attention of uh, um, of the citizens, and, and um, that's uh, in itself is is already a good experience uh, to see. But we're looking forward to. Um, to the uh, energy communities uh, um, being operational uh, in in uh, in the legal context uh, without restrictions, uh, as they will as there will be uh, uh, still for the first up uh, startup of of uh, energy communities in in uh, in Belgian law. Maybe I can comment. I saw also one one uh, question on uh, Bosch. Um, where where can we find more information? I believe the um, the the Bosch, um, as I mentioned, they have now their own um, small scale startup um, of uh, rental, and in it, it, uh, it, I believe it is called Blue Movement, uh, Bosch Blue Movement. Um, and the um, uh, rental of uh, refurbished ones is not in the blue movement. Uh, that's only Belgium small scale, uh, but I'm not sure if there's um, public data on that. I tried to Google it now, but I can't find um, anything on this. So I, I think that's still uh, um, uh, too local and too experimental to, uh, to make a big uh, communication campaign about this. Okay, thank you, Leon. Um, um, actually, we arrived at the end of our webinar because it's 11.30. Mm -hmm. oh, I think I will give you the floor to conclude. Yes. Uh, well, perhaps, Melissa, we can stop the recording now. Thank you. <laughs>